Good evening, everybody. It is Thursday night. Every week we go live at this time. And tonight I have something really, really special in store. Somebody I've been looking to do something with for a very long time. He and I have been talking for years about doing something. And this is kind of our, you know, first shot at a real collaboration. Uh, my guest this evening will be Rick Orlando. He's legendary Hudson Valley chef. He he's ha he he has his hands in so many things right now. But you may know him from New World Bistro. New new he was the chef and consultant there, um, and New World Home Cooking down in Saugerties. I am going to bring him directly on here without any further ado, and uh, we're going to get sauced tonight. Rick, welcome to the show. I do. Hello. <laughs> So um, thanks so much for joining us. I think um, I, I thought this would be a good idea because I know that you have you're trying to get some stuff going with YouTube and you have a lot of irons in the fire. So, um, you know, I love local collaboration. So yeah, figured I'd give it a shot. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're up to. I, I'm, we're going to hit a lot of things tonight, but um, we can start there and then we'll talk about what we're drinking. All right. So. You know, for the first time in more than most people's lifetimes, I'm not a restaurant chef, which is kind of fascinating to me. I've been basically a restaurant chef since, I mean, I've been cooking since my teens, but since my late 20s, since I started at Justin's, I became the chef and I was a restaurant chef. So that was from 1989. So what are we talking? 31 years? Yeah. And uh, I kind of miss the every day, but I don't really, you know, I'm... I'm I do so. Here's what I'm doing now. I to get my chops to keep my my gig almost like a musician. I do two pop ups a month. I do one at Cafe Capriccio, which is a, a wine dinner, relatively high end, really cool. Um, Jim Rua and Franco Rua are like dynamite. We've been friends forever, and we take over the whole restaurant. And I do like a right now we're doing something called the Italian Diaspora. So we're taking parts of the world where a lot of Italians migrated to and how we, they interpreted the food of Italy, and we're doing wine dinners with that. So we've done Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Creole Italian. We're going to do Australian this coming month, which is really interesting. I had no idea so many Italians, over 60,000 Italians emigrated to Australia after World War II. So that's that's going to be interesting. i got a friend there that I'm talking to who's, who's Sicilian. Like, what is different about the food there? So we'll be doing that. I'm working on that menu. And then at the lower landing in um, Coxsackie, New York, my friend Kim Bender owns a little cafe right down on Reed Street, right down by the water. And I started doing pop-ups there, even when I was still at the Bistro, like in 2018, when I closed New World Home Cooking. And I do a pop-up a month there. We're doing a Portuguese one at the end of the month. And those are really fun. So those are my two cooking gigs, right? And then I launched uh, Flavor Maker Spices, which ended up getting a corporate name called, yeah, uh, Richter, right here, I got my jerk right in front of me, called uh, the Richter Scale brand is the corporate name. And the Richter Scale, if those of you who have never dined at any of my restaurants, back in the early 90s, when I opened my first restaurant, I decided I wanted to sell the world's best spicy food. And we were doing Caribbean and Thai and Indian and, you know, Mesoamerican and, and African and all these great I was using, you know, 30 different types of chilies in the restaurant, really into it. And I was blown away. I was like in my early 30s and didn't realize that most of the public had no idea what I was doing. And I was burning people's faces off. So someone said, can you please come up with the spice rating? So I did a one to 10 thing, right? So a couple months into it, some lady was eating uh, some St. Tom and shrimp thing I, I did with scones and rum and et cetera. And she said, oh, my God, that dish was so hot. I'm going to die. You rated it as a six, but it's got to be a 10. And I said, oh, what's your name? She said, my name's Myrna. I said, it's a 10 on the Myrna scale, Myrna scale, but it's a six on the Rick scale. And someone in my kitchen said, the Richter scale, and made this, like, uh, earthquake motion. I said, there you go. That's the name. So from, like, 1994 on, my menu always had the Richter scale rating. So... That's what we called the company, the Richter Scale. So Flavor Maker Spices are the spice blends. Richter Scale is the is the major bland, brand. Um, you know, McCormick owns this thing called Flavor Maker, but they don't own a trademark and they don't own the website and all that. And I own all that, but I don't want to get into a battle with Flavor Maker. So uh, with McCormick, maybe it might be fun, but uh, so that's that. So that's going great. That's all over the place where 
Um, the spices are going great regionally. And um, it's funny. Talk about a diaspora. I sell a lot of spices all around the country on um, sh you know shipping through the website. And I realized that probably three quarters of those people are people that were from upstate New York or Woodstock that had eaten in my restaurants They're in Arizona, California, Puerto Rico. They want the flavors. So I created those flavors so that people who miss New World, because you know, when I left New World, I took the menu with me. They did a whole new thing with Zach Welton, which is great. And he's a great chef, but there's no more of Rick's dishes. So people say, where can I get your food? I'm like, cook it yourself. <laughs> I got the spices. So that's going. And then I've got three little fun projects. I got more, but the three major ones. Um, I'm doing videos for Tierra Farms. I just did six videos last week using all of their nuts and seeds and chocolate and coffee in recipes. So we shot six videos. I'll be doing videos for them. I'm doing um, toppings for Four Fat Fowl. Uh, they're in Agata Ricotta. Um, I developed three, I developed a bunch, but we're launching three toppings probably in about a month or two. We're waiting for Cornell Cooperative scheduling process to come back and new packaging. But they want to take their ricotta and make it like a grab and go eat ricotta, kind of like a yogurt cup. So I developed, we're doing um, a honey harissa, a blueberry jalapeno, and a Mexican chocolate topping. So they all have a little spice and a little sweet. So that's the second thing. And uh, what did I say? Oh, and the third one is I'm making, I'm doing work with Field Goods, field-goods.com. I did a bunch of videos for them, uh, live stream videos and YouTube videos. And then uh, they took my hot sauce. They took the Flavor Maker Spice line. And then they said, can you make us something for Mardi Gras? So I made gumbo. I made, I'm working out of the Ulster County Community Action has a licensed food preparation kitchen there for, for packaging. So I went and made them like, you know, 20 gallons of gumbo in frozen quarts. And now they have my eggplant balls all the time on their menu. And downstairs, they have a big pot of caldo verde because I show up there every other week and say, what do you got? And they say, we got a bunch of Yukon gold potatoes. We got way too much kale. I'm like, bring it on. And I go and make, I make food out of that. So those are the three side projects aside from the pop-ups and aside from the spice line that are active. There are more things. People call me and just want me to do stuff. So I'm kind of like, and I'm doing a lot of not-for-profit stuff. I'm, uh, I've done stuff with the uh, Center for Positive Health, which is the AIDS Council, LGBTQ Center, the Regional Food Bank. We're doing one coming up in April for uh, the Hudson Valley Food Bank, where I go on and do like live cooking like this, like live, live stream cooking classes and stuff. So I'm not bored. I'm really not bored. I thought I was going to be bored. I am not bored. I spent a month after I left the bistro in June, early early June, gardening, and I built a tomato cage, and did it. Oh, this is fun. And then I said, wait a minute, I'm too young to be retired. So <laughs> that's when we started the spice line, and before you know it, I'm working my ass off every day. That's I, I, that's awesome. I mean, even hearing, I get stressed out hearing about all the things that you're doing and following everything that you're doing on social media. It's just it's just crazy. I did want to take a second to acknowledge, we got a bunch of people in the chat. They're lighting us up as oh, far cool. as comments. Um, I, what I'm going to say is uh, leave your comments in the chat. And in a few minutes, what I'll do is I'll pull some of those up and uh, me and Rick can react to those comments. Um, I want to talk, I noticed you just took a sip. Well, tell us a little bit about what you're drinking tonight. All right. So I had pho for dinner. I had some chicken pho, actually turkey pho, because I, I had a bunch of turkey. Turkey, the best value meat you can buy. And I like to have a little Amaro after dinner. I've got a nice collection. I've got about 15 Amati in my little wine cooler. This one tonight is Cardamaro. It's a, I'm sorry, the screen is backwards. I'm twisting it the wrong way. In a proper little Amaro glass. Served chilled, but not on the rocks. You keep them in a cooler. This is an Amaro made with about 18 different herbs and spices and cardoons. Um, it's not that different from Chinar, which is the artichoke liqueur but a little less bitter. It's got a little more of a vanilla complexity to it. It's, it's quite delicious. And I'll have two or three of them before we're off the air, I'm sure. Nice, that's awesome. So for tonight, I actually, I haven't done an alcoholic beverage in a while, but I figured I'd bring it back tonight. I went beer shopping for the first time in a really long time tonight. And I noticed this trend of hazy IPAs. Now- Yes, I drink enough IPA, I get hazy. 
So I've <laughs> never tried one before. So I, I picked one up and I'm big with on the dogfish head beers. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I'm part, very partial to them. Now I will say nothing about this sounds like it'd be appealing to me. The only reason why I, why I went with it was because we're talking a little bit more about purple haze sauce tonight. So I wanted to go with the theme of the haze. There you go. So I'm going to crack mine open. I'm going to read a glass it. for it. Do you have a glass? Because the hazy IPA, you really want to look at it. Yeah, of, co of course. I do have a glass. Over, right? It's actually customized with family. Oh, look at that. <laughs> so let me read off this because I, I, I read this and I'm like, that can't be good. It says, uh, juicy, hazy IPA brewed with one malted, two rolled, three naked oats, and four oat milk. So I don't know, guys. I uh, Get your fork and knife out. It's going to be a biggie. Yeah, it's seven percent alcohol. Okay. Which for me, I, I usually like a good between like six and ten percent. That's kind of my comfort zone. Yeah, I, I poured that pretty bad. It's pretty hazy. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you got purple on behind you too. Very cool, Jerry. What's that? You got a purple backdrop tonight too. Yeah, I mean, I could change the color. I, I, no, I, I like can purple. Make it rotate. <laughs> All right, so here we go. I mean, it tastes like a general IPA. I, I don't really taste much different. Well, they're, I think not, they're not clarified. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of makes a lot of beer vegan that might not be vegan. A lot of the filtration of beer sometimes will have egg white or, you know, different types of fish, uh, bone charcoal in the filtering systems. And it's just, it's a raw beer. You know, it's a fresh raw beer. They're, they're kind of delicious, actually. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I like it. And it's not as... It, it's not as refined tasting. Usually my go-to dogfish is the 90 minute IPA. That's yeah. like my everyday drinking beer. Um, wow, you're, you're rich. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> <come> <laughs> it's not, so not every day. If, if I'm going to drink a, a beer at, not for not a special occasion, it'd be that, but I don't drink very often to be completely I, honest. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't drink that much beer anymore. I love beer. I find that I, you know, it bloats me. It makes me. It makes me feel bloated and full. So, Same. Um, I've been drinking a lot of uh, lighter beers. I've been drinking um, Chatham Brewery's Checkered Pass, which is a, a Czechoslovakian pilsner. It's kind of modeled after the original, like Pilsner Urquell before they became export beers with preservatives and stuff. Mm -hmm. Light, and you know, five and a half percent alcohol. Um, but, you know, I've got a lot of beers in the cooler, and I do break out good beers once in a while. Yeah. I was thinking about getting a cooler for my little nook here, but uh, one day. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I got a little wine cooler, and it's got mostly – it's got a few wines in it, mostly Amaro pickles and beer in it. Not actually wine coolers, right? Right. No. <laughs> I make my own there. There you go. So let's, let's hop into a little bit of the Purple Haze. So I wanted to talk about this, and the reason why was from way back, I was a fan of the Purple Haze sauce. Uh, you know, we talked about the tie dye pie that you used to make it at New World. Mm -hmm. It basically is a pizza with the um, with this sauce, the purple haze sauce. It had a tomato sauce. What, what, it had tomato sauce too. Oh, just purple haze and four cheeses. Yep, I was going to say four, four cheeses. And that yep. the first time I tried that, I'm like, wow, this place is not messing around with the spice. <laughs> and I made a mistake one time, and I, I we went on a night. And I said, I'm going to order the jerk chicken, but I'm going to do the 10 stars this time. And I remember on the menu, there was the little clause about if you order this, you can't send it back. And if you order anything nine or higher, yeah, dine at your own risk. And I, I powered through it. it I, I probably, usually a, a meal at New World Bistro was pretty quick, I would say, in terms of like that style dining. Mm -hmm. We were there for quite a while while I was nursing that, but I, I got through it and I loved it. So yeah, I find that when you get, you know, when you get like one of the things I've worked on my whole career is learning how to master using heat. I'm talking chili heat in a way that is not um, harsh, but is balanced. It makes you. A lot of people would tell me that they they find some of those dishes to be like a slippery slope where once you start, you start eating faster. You can't stop because it's kind of like this adrenaline thing. I learned how to cook um, fiery food from two chefs. One was Vietnamese and one was from St. Thomas. And I have to tell you, the Caribbean, even right to this day, the Caribbean hot sauces to me are still the most delicious. They're not like 
as they used to be the hottest, but then the Reaper and all that came in. And there's a lot of what we call shock sauces out there to me. There, I don't. I'm not a fan. I don't. I don't disrespect them, but it's like I can put 20% Reaper in vinegar and sell that as a hot sauce. But like Matooks, Lotties, um, Windmill, all those West Indian sauces. You go to a West Indian store, you can grab them. You know, Walker's Wood. There's such a balance to them where they're hot as hell, but they've got all kinds of complexity and and layers of flavor. So I always tried to achieve that when I made hot food. I didn't want to just harsh you to death. Like some cooks would just throw cayenne in food and call it hot. And it's like, it is hot, but it's not delicious. And, you know, when I first discovered Matuk's hot sauce, which is one of my emails, which you might know, Matuk's at Gmail, yep. um, I couldn't believe how fast I went through a bottle of that. And it's like a big ketchup bottle. Yep. And I went through it in about a week. And I was just like glugging it on on turkey sandwiches, on hot dogs, on eggs, um, dipping crackers into it. And, you know, I would, I would probably go through a quarter cup at a sitting. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I didn't – a little cleansing for you. But uh, <laughs> but it's so it's so layered and the, the flavors are so beautiful. And that's why I'm still a fan of the um, – the scotch bonnet and the habanero pepper because the balance of heat to flavor there's still a lot of that i call them cantaloupes from hell that makes melony flavor mm -hmm. but the purple haze was originally not purple so you want to know the story right is that why we're here yeah absolutely i, I actually was curious how <laughs> whatever makes this purple got in there to be honest okay so new world home cooking the original building i don't know if you were in there it was the old stone house on xena road the 1720 stone house had like three little dining rooms. We sat like 60, sat another 60 outside in the summer. Um, I was doing this dish that I kind of learned from Johnny Levins, a West Indian cook I started, I worked with. It was called a scotch bonnet and ginger beer shrimp. Basically through butter in a pan with shrimp, garlic, shallots, flame, uh, not flame, hit it with ginger beer right out of the bottle. A bunch of fresh scotch bonnets, some thyme, some scallions, a little butter, mounted it all up, served it over. Sweet, hot, delicious, right? There was, uh, we had a lot of really cool musicians and skateboarders and artists. Woodstock has a, an amazingly weird audience. And there was this guy named Matt Henderson, who was one of the editors of Guitar Player Magazine at the time. And he was in Woodstock doing a feature on uh, Dr. No, Gary Samuels from the Bad Brains, who's a good friend of ours. Our kids grew up together. but he So he was eating in my restaurant almost every night because Gary lived across the street from the restaurant. So one day he, he was ordering the, the scotch bonnet ginger beer shrimp every night, either as an appetizer or an entree. And he comes in the kitchen. He's this little guy, shaved head, you know, kind of skater looking dude. And he's like, dude, I want it like 11. I want it like 15, man. Fuck the 10, make it a 15, hurt me, hurt me. So so I did. I put about a half a cup of scotch bonnets in this dish and cooked them in there, cooked them with the butter. You know, chilies, uh, the capsicum combines with oil. A lot of those super hot sauces are oleoresin extract. They're basically, they take the capsicum, the stuff that hurts, and they bind it with fat. So anyway, he was came in the kitchen, and he was like, dude, I'm tripping. Oh, my God, I'm tripping. And he started air guitaring Purple Haze. Uh, 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 you know, do this little air guitar thing right in the kitchen. And he said, you got you to gotta dedicate this to Hendrix. I'm saying, you got to make it purple. So I went through a bunch of experiments. I used, tried blueberries, sucked. Tried beets, horrible. Um, and just out of the corner of my eye, we had made some slaw that we had put a little bit of red cabbage in, and the whole thing turned turned purple and I was like red cabbage now cabbage was also fascinating because cabbage has a lot of cellulose and the um the capsaicin in the chilies binds with cellulose and passes through your body easily you'll see a lot of cultures that eat a lot of chilies have high cellulose diets beans tropical fruits cabbages you know things that nuts you know so anyway, I got the red cabbage in there, and the rest is history. 1995, we launched Purple Haze in bottles. Uh, it's a new website, Purple Haze Hot Sauce. There's a picture of one of the original bottles on there. That uh, uh, Actually, it was uh, Alex from, uh, from Tipsy Moose. His father had a bottle of the original Purple Haze, and he took a picture of it and sent it to me uh, recently. 
Um, so that was uh, that was when Purple Haze came out, and it was a thing. It's become a thing. It's been a thing for a long time. And I have to tell you, these bottles, man, people are buying it like crazy right now, which is great. That's awesome. It's funny that you mentioned that the, that it was basically you know based on some customer interactions. My my dad, I don't know if you know, my dad owned a deli in Middletown. Um, and we used to, it was a Brooklyn style deli, used to make all the sausage and everything. And, um, he had a customer that one day decided that he wanted to basically hire my dad to make the hottest sausage he ever ate. And the guy walked in with an entire case of habanero peppers. Um, and my dad, he, my dad is not, he, my dad can eat spicy. He's Calabrese, mm -hmm. but, um, he's not really big in the habanero heat. Uh, and I remember I was working there that when, when he did that and he put about 60% by mass of the peppers and about 40% of the meat oh to, my the God. Where, to the point where barely they weren't even holding together. And my dad was like, this guy is going to, he's going to, he's, he's not going to be able to eat these. Well, turns out the guy picked them up like a few days later, came in the next day and he said, you know, those weren't hot enough. Oh, <laughs> I'm just mad. You know, it, it is it is like a pain threshold. You know, I, I like I like balancing. I mean, the purple haze has pineapple, it has ginger, it has thyme, it has all these really nice layers of complexity. Um, and people are finding they love it on unusual things. It's great on pizza for some reason. It's great in mac and cheese. It does amazing things to mac and cheese, um, curry stews and stuff. It really works well with richly flavored food, which is important. Yeah. You know, that's cool. So yeah. I'm going to back you up a second. Um, you said it's good on pizza. I actually got some pizza. Ah. And we're going to try it. So, Who's pizza? Now, this is just a plain slice of pizza. And it has not been reheated. Oh, cool. So I think um, we're going to see if the sauce is going to make it. Yeah, put it down the middle and then do the fold. It okay. covers it all that way. All right. So you said put it down the middle. I just put a stripe down the middle. Yep. And then do a nice fold so it kind of climbs up the sides. All right. Can, you, can I see that? I don't see it right now. Good. There you go. Oh, right. oof. Now we got to talk about this for a second. <laughs> okay. You said, there was, you said there was pineapple in this, right? Pineapple juice. So um, what's your thoughts of pineapple on pizza? You know, Jerry, it's a <laughs> funny thing. I am from New Haven. I'm from, like, you know, the pizza elitist culture, really. It, it's very elitist. As pizza, and it is the best pizza in the country. Let's not even go anywhere with that. But... I'm not adverse to pineapple on pizza if it's a good pizza. I don't think pineapple makes a shitty pizza good, but I've had pineapple on like a really good, thin, crispy, creamy in the middle crust with blisters and bubbles and some char. Whatever, it's pineapple. The, the pineapple in the purple haze is not necessarily a distinguishing aspect of the sauce, but it adds an acidity and sweetness without being sweet that pineapple has. That if you were to try to figure out what was in Purple Haze, very few people would say pineapple. When they read the ingredients, they're like, oh, pineapple, that's what it is. Because it's, it's got kind of a stealth acidity to it, you know? Yep. I remember, so about six or seven years ago, you used to have your blog. And um, I you had the recipes for the Purple Haze, or at least a recipe. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there was some proprietary stuff you weren't telling us it there. And also the jerk. And I back-to-back -back made both sauces. And they both have pineapple juice in it. Mm -hmm. I remember I, I I don't normally ever buy pineapple juice, and I had those. I bought the cans for that, and I thought that was pretty cool. As far as the pizza with the, with the purple haze sauce, I gotta say, it's definitely really good. The one thing that the pineapple isn't really the thing that's throwing me off on this. It's the habanero. Mm -hmm. I ha never had pizza with habanero, so that was that's kind of an experience. But as far well, as everything else, you had to come up in tonight then. Yeah, Probably I mean, the cheese is warm too. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure of that. I mean, this is just pizza from like a corner pizza shop that I I, I got. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the best pizza, but I I will say I uh, I I like hot sauce on a lot of stuff, and this is definitely a little different, but definitely really good. I I gotta say.
Well, you know, oh. thank you. I, I like uh, sriracha on pizza a lot. And Purple Haze, it's different from sriracha, but it has similar characteristics. It's got that little sourness um, from the cabbage. It gives you a little ferment flavor. Um, and it, it does a similar thing to me. That little tang and sourness, not just vinegar. I don't like a vinegary sauce on my pizza. Although, frankly, classic Tabasco is pretty good on pizza. But I think the Purple Haze on a nice hot, cheesy pie is pretty damn good. Yeah, no, I, I, that's definitely opened my eyes. I, I normally would eat this on something like chicken wings or, um, you know, earlier this week I posted a, a, a recipe video, you know, using it with some fried shrimp to make like a... I saw that. Yeah, that was great. Try yeah. it on mac and cheese. I'll tell you, it really loves fatty stuff. It's great on mac and cheese. And, you know, in the West Indies, it's like soul food. Mac and cheese is a part of the diet. I mean, people think yep. of rice and peas, rice and peas, which it is, but mac and cheese is very popular. And it works great with that. It really does. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That so you know what's cool. coming next, right? What's We're that? In the process now is talking to Ruben. It's going to be backwards. That was right. Dirty, Dirty blonde. Do you, have so, you had that at the restaurant? No, I. I it's so another that, one of our. This is, this is the thing. I when I find something that I, I like, I usually don't stray too far from it. As far as things I've ordered, we, we used to come down to to. Um, the uh, Saugerties location a lot too. And I, I would basically get the sa same stuff you could order in, in Albany. Um, mm -hmm. So I haven't, tell me a little bit about it. So Dirty Blonde, that's another oldie but goodie. I started doing that one probably in uh, our third or fourth year. I was looking for, I liked honey mustard, okay? But honey mustard was always left me kind of flat. So I started messing around with honey mustard sauces. And I came up with a couple of simple ones using really good spicy mustard and using, um, cor <laughs> cor excuse me, <laughs> that's not COVID. I just choked. Uh, <laughs> coriander. I'm getting my shot uh, Saturday, by the way. Nice. I'm going next Friday. Yep. And uh, so Dirty Blonde is a sauce that's made with tropical juices again, um, honey, mustard, dry mustard, turmeric, and habanero. So it's kind of like, <laughs> excuse me, I got to. <laughs> I got a little choke. Let me get some tomorrow here. Hold on. Yeah, I'm, I'm still burning a little from the from the purple haze. Honestly, you're glowing, man. Here, I'll, <laughs> I'll catch up to you. Hold on. Um, anyway, it's it's a really great. We call it sweet, hot, and sticky sauce because it, it's hot, it's sweet. There, there you so, go. Nice to catch up to you. Nice. <laughs> That's good. Wow. Actually, somebody had asked me on Twitter if I was going to drink purple haze out of the bottle, and I think I think I just poured enough onto that slice of pizza that I, that qualifies. Hey, Rory, what's going on? I see you comment there. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to put a couple comments up here. Mac and cheese definitely needs something. You know, it's funny. I'm going to tell you something. Being an Italian growing up, I hated mac and cheese. Me too. I hated it. It was like it was like that American cheese flavor. I love big ZD. I loved all that. I hated mac and cheese. But now I've learned. I mean, we I've won a couple years in a row. There's a mac and cheese bowl down in Kingston for it's for Angel Food East. It's at Keegan Ales. They have a fundraiser and it's a people's choice. Last year I did a really absurd one. And won some kind of plaque. I think it was for um, didn't think I was going to like it award. I did a Nutella and uh, and and Mexican chili mac and cheese, but I've done Caribbean mac and cheese where I've done habanero and Scotch bonnet and crab and all that okra like in the mac and cheese. I love messing it that way. It's fun. Hmm. Very interesting. So I um I I, I made notes just in case uh. We ran out of stuff to talk to. Do you do you have time? Or are you are you? Uh, I'm good. Yeah. No, I'm fine. All right, good. Well, we'll we'll keep it going for a little longer. It looks like. Yeah, I was gonna say one more. I'm doing. I'm in the middle of prepping some stuff. One more thing I'm doing is, uh, I decided to do the Sunday markets at the Troy Farmers Market up in uh, Lansingburg. Ask about that. And yeah, and um, so you know, I have my whole product line, but I make a few things, a few surprises every week just for fun. Uh, to sell there too. So I'm messing around with that right now. Pretty cool. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to do while, while I had you on, I, I actually have your website up and what I'm going to do is put it up on the screen. There, there are some people asking where they can get, get your stuff. So 
here it yeah, is. Star Locator is really you can buy it online. And I, you know, I'm really thankful for anyone who buys it online. But if you live locally, save the shipping and support some of these stores. Um, is on the top is a link for a store locator. Yep. Um, and it has you know, uh, we're we're in a lot of places locally. Um, you get down to Albany County right now. Uh, on a sweet different drummers kitchen. Uh, Van Allen Farms, if you guys are, you know, down in the Selkirk or Bethlehem area, Primal picked it up, which is good. Roma's got it. Uh, Niski on a co-op. Tons of places in Saratoga County because I'm working with Paul Johnson, a small distributor who's based in Round, uh, Round Lake. So he has, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff. A lot of places in Ulster. We just placed it in a few more places. And I update that every couple of weeks. Yep. But, yeah, there's a lot. If you go to the store locator, if you have the opportunity to buy it locally, I really like to support local you'll notice there are no big chains on there yep um you know we may eventually end up in price chopper right now i'm trying to focus on just getting it in independence and uh supporting the local people and co-supporting each other you know yep yeah so i i um thank I you bro to... thank you man go ahead um, dom is my brother actually he uh, oh. he's, a, he's a aspiring guitarist he's on youtube as well cool um so as far as as far as the website, I put links in the video description. After the video, you can go check out. I put a link to Rick Orlando's YouTube, and I put a link to his website here. If you click on the shop, you could see all the awesome stuff he has here. And I want to draw your attention to one more thing. Uh, if you go to recipes, he actually has on his little blog here the legendary New World jerk chicken recipe. So make sure you check that out. I have tried this recipe, and I perpetually have a jar of that jerk sauce in my fridge at all times because it's that good. It is good. I made some last night actually. So yeah, I wanted to make sure we brought that up before uh, things got a little crazy here. Now, how do you stop this? There we go. Yeah, tell your brother I'm on a desktop now, but if I can show him this corner of the room, there's... Oh, I could do that. One, two, three guitars hanging right now and a few in cases. So this is also my music room. Yeah, now, that you, was one, you, one thing you I mentioned. the corner of the seagull. Um, I've got a bass I'm working on. I got a 64 Fender um, uh, Music Master bass, and I've got a bunch of stuff. It's fun. I have nothing else to do with my time, you know? There you go. I, I actually, uh, you, when when you first appeared on Food Network Chopped, they had a little video package of you, and they, they had you on a stage with the guitar performing. It was kind of one of those things. Usually the chefs don't, they don't show personality. I don't know if you watch Chopped enough. I haven't watched it in years, but back at that time, uh, I remember just being like, "Wow, this guy! He's uh, he, he's from Saugerties, you know, area, and he's a a rocker." Um, that, whoops, there I am. There you are. So yeah. Yeah, you know it's funny, Jerry. I'm gonna tell you honestly. When I first, I kind of like did music and food simultaneously. You know, I was in Boston, and Boston is a great place to be in a band, and you can work uh, because it was such a vibrant lunch trade all the restaurants were full of like local musicians during the day on the lunch shift. I worked like nine 30 to three, you know, it was a perfect gig for me, made just enough money to pay the rent, but, and I ate, which was great. I always got to eat and I worked in some great restaurants and learned a lot about food. But at a certain point, you know, the, the band I was in, in Boston, um, we ran our course did five years, did a couple records broke up. And that's when I kind of flipped from music as my dream and restaurants as something to fall back on to really focusing in on being a chef. And for the first seven or eight years of owning restaurants, I didn't really push my music. I played music with people, but I didn't want to talk about it. I wanted to focus on my chef career. Then around 2000, 2001, I realized what, and I, I was hanging out with people like Joey Ramone and David Johansson and the dictators, all these musicians were in town and, I got to know them and I was like, why the fuck don't I just like play it? So when the Food Network approached me and they said, would you be comfortable talking about your music past? I'm like, bring it on, baby. You know, I, this is my life. This is who I am. I've done it. And it's one of the reasons why I'm the kind of chef I am because I was always the front man of a band. And I I think they're, they're very similar positions. A chef is not a cook. A chef cooks and a chef is a great cook. But a chef is like a band leader. A chef has to get everybody on board, has to make the set list, has to, you know, work with the with the road crew, has to work with the booking agents, where the musicians, 
the leader of a band does that, right? And the rest of the musicians, they, they learn their parts, they show up and they play them. So I was always kind of a chef in the, like, on the stage or a front man in the kitchen. Same kind of thing. It's just a you know, stupid personality type that I have, but you know, it, 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 you're, you're in control of what's going on. You know, you're calling the set. And um, so I'm, I went with it and the Food Network just had a, they had a blast with it. And I, I was laughing. I mean, I really hammed it up. They said, can you ham it up? I'm like, sure, whatever you want. I don't care. Ham it up. A great story. My daughter at the time was going to Concordia in Montreal and she was bartending in this like uh, Italian hockey bar and uh, barista bartender, right? And my episode of Chopped came on on a rerun while she was working. And she told me the story. She said it was great. There was a bunch of like, you know, 12 tooth hockey lugs at the bar looking at the TV saying, Oh man, you got to root for the rock and roll guy from Woodstock, man. He's got to be the guy you root for. And she was almost too embarrassed to say, Well, that's like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. We yeah. got a couple questions in the chat. So I'll pull them up and uh, we'll get your reaction. So, my friend Brian, who also is a musician, he um he asked, "What's your what are your five, top five favorite bands?" Wow, you know, I was thinking about that the other day, and I have different favorite bands for different things. I think that my favorite artist of all time is David Bowie, end to end. There were some eras of Bowie that I didn't love, and there were some eras like his Berlin time, like from Low through Scary Monsters, that I think is some of the best music ever. So I would put Bowie at the top. Um, I love the Pixies a lot. I remember seeing them when they first came back from recording the first album. I have like a big spot in my heart for the Pixies. Um, Jesus, the clash had a really big impact on me. Joe Strummer had a big impact on me. You know, it's like, I'm in your face and that's all there is to it. I'm going to say what I think and you can go to hell. Joe Strummer had a big impact on me. When I was in high school, my high school graduation picture, I had long hair, big onk on, and it said, Rick Orlando, a Black Sabbath enthusiast, future is in music. So I like Black Sabbath growing up. I mean, Alice Cooper and Black Sabbath were my, were my, my you know, jams as a kid. And Iggy Pop is one of my favorites. Old Iggy, new Iggy. Iggy as an 80-year-old guy, you know, with, you know, I've been, I, I spent the other night watching uh, YouTube videos of, old Iggy, current Iggy on stage, he's still doesn't wear a shirt. He's got like a 75 year old, 80 year old, year old man's body. He's limping. doesn't matter. He's still Iggy. He's still great. Um, I also like, uh, you know, I mean, I like some R and B. Um, I was a really big fan of Sly and the Family Stone, Sly Stone, P-Funk, that kind of stuff. They had a really big impact on me. I have a very diverse, musical taste dr john was one of the people i'd find myself it's funny you know now that i'm not doing music i kind of find myself listening to certain music more often than others and that's kind of who i'm bringing up right now i, I made a mix of all the songs in the rolling stones that keith richards sings <laughs> and then i found out later there's an album of all those songs on one album but you know i like i like i like i do like the rolling stones a lot but I really like Keith Richards a lot. He's another uh, icon for me. And, you know, the Ramones were fun. I mean, some bands are more fun than others, but I think Bowie and The Clash had the most, like, impact on my thought process. Early Elvis Costello, you know, songwriting-wise was pretty important. Um, and there's a lot of, but there's, I, I just don't like music that sucks. I don't like music that sucks. And how do you define sucks? Sucks is it's lacking one of three things. It's lacking originality, or it's lacking a reason to like it, like a hook, or it has no balls. Mm -hmm. You need one of those three things. The music with balls I can listen to. I like pop music. I don't necessarily like contemporary pop that much because there's not – when I grew up in the 60s and 70s learning to play guitar and learning the art of writing pop songs, I had a power pop band. You know, I love that kind of music. There was a structure that you learned that had innuendo, right? You had different ways of, of phrasing. And you also had what we used to call like swoon changes, like the Beatles, a lot of the Motown songs, they have bridges that make you kind of go, ooh, and they bring your attention back. And one of the things that kills me about so many pop songs now is that they come up with one good riff 
and one good melody, and that's it. And they don't have that second, that's that B section that, you know, James Brown, I like that, you know, like, give me that B section, guys. You know, it's like you shift gears and just, you know, like my son's in a metal band and they have breakdowns and the breakdown kind of like slaps you in the face, gets your attention and gets you back into the song. If you're, if you're nodding out or you're, you're looking out the window or you're talking to your girlfriend. So um, that's, that's important to me. I, I think it's, it's funny. You say, you mentioned that. I, I think in the last, I would say maybe 10 to 20 years, pop music has taken a turn. It's, it's very different. The, the icons are not what they were you know, back, back then and even the song quality. But I think a lot of that has to do with attention span. And I think you hit it there talking about your son's band there. Um, I think most of this stuff now is designed for retention. And, yeah. you know, for by not having that B section, they don't lose you and you can get into the next track. And, you know, they're, they're trying to get well, the people. They're actually to pull you in. Right. That was the idea is when, when you had that little bridge, it was like, ah. Oh. You know, you right. kind of your spine tangle. It was like a really well structured change is like awesome. But yeah, I think I think a lot of it is computers too. Yeah. Because, you know, up until I mean, I remember when I was recording in the late eighties, automation started happening, right? And so by the mid nineties when I was recording, a lot of stuff was getting automated to the point where you could write a little riff and just put it in your put it, you know, in your computer. And it just played over and over, and you could sing to it. And I can identify that. I worked in the studio enough where you can I can identify where someone is actually sitting on a guitar or a piano writing a song versus put a program in and just let it kind of play. That yeah. doesn't for me. Every once in a while, you find one that is just like, okay, you did something really great. And some of them are goofy as hell. I was in the car a couple days ago, and I had YouTube on the car, and it was just on autoplay. And for some reason, Who Let the Dogs Out came on, right? I don't know what I was. I think I was listening to Atomic Dog by George Clinton, and it, that came in the mix. Okay. And I listened to it all the way through, and I said, that song is brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's one riff, but it's a chant. It's got a breakdown. It's got a. It's got all the things that make a pop song great. You know. Yep. You want to hear? I, I, and I'm not. I don't want to sound like an old geezer. You don't hear a shirt like that anymore. But I'm not the only person who's written about this. That the melodic and structure of pop songs has become really simplistic to the point yeah. where, you know, it doesn't appeal to me. I like a little more intellectual oomph to my songs. Yep. No, I, I definitely hear you on that. All right. We got another question here. What does Rick think of the chili crisp phenomenon? Chili crisp phenomenon? What is it? I don't know. What is it? Right? I guess the, the, res the resurgence of things like hot chili oil and oh like it, yeah, hot crispy oil like john's company yeah it's pretty it, it seems like there's a lot that's coming out of the woodwork a lot I, that's a very popular one locally and i tried that recently it's very good yeah um but it's not i i've seen a few i think trader joe's has one now mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting so i guess um I, you know, I've already, I, I ever thought of it as a phenomenon because i've been doing it my whole career absolutely <laughs> been doing it forever. I grew up in an Italian household. We had two types of hot oil on the back of the stove all the time. We had one that was made with fresh Italian hot peppers, cooked almost like a confit, right? An extra virgin olive oil. And they sat in a peanut butter jar in the back of the stove. Olio Santo. And, and then we had the Olio Santo Nero, where you took the dried peppers and you cooked them until they were almost black. And you left them in the jar. And I would spoon that on my garlic and oil, like a pasta with garlic and oil or puttanesca. Um, and so we would do that. And even at the bistro, I was going through our old menus. And I think in 2011, we served a burrata, what we call burnt chili oil, which we would crumble. We cooked three or four different types of Mexican chilies. Guajillos were one of them, which had thin skins, cooked them in extra virgin until they would get almost black, cool them, drizzle that oil on and crumble the chilies on it. It's kind of cool that it's a phenomenon. You know, we are, I'm going to say something kind of bizarre, but I was talking to a friend yesterday. We've become, because of the um, proliferation, really, of the way we all communicate through our phones and through social media, it's created a real, like, copycat and lemming-like culture because things just, they become so big so fast that you have to be a part of it, you know? Um, so if it's a phenomenon, well, you know what? It uses chilies. I guess I'm okay with it. There you go. Yeah, I mean that nothing says that more than what happened last year with like TikTok foods and like the Dalgona coffee 
which uh, yeah. like most people never heard of that. I mean, I, I never heard of that. And all of a sudden everybody is making it in quarantine. Um, so just and very interesting. Sourdough. And the sourdough phenomenon. Sourdough. I, I, I jumped on that. And the reason why was uh, I was working from home a lot and it was something I always had wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And the resources for it just became exponential. So I figured, you know, if, if I've never had luck with this in the past, now I'll have luck with it. And honestly, your your video the with the biga was mm. one of the first videos that i saw on the sourdough phenomenon that kind of got me thinking you know what maybe i should try it yeah why not i mean i've made it i don't eat a ton of bread anymore and, and i haven't for years but i love really great bread and i make my own bread but i'm i budget it like i'll be because i can eat a whole loaf of bread like that you know you know we're italian man yep so like right now I've been, I've been making an amazing semolina bread, like two pound loaves of semolina bread. But after it's cooled, I cut them into two to three ounce portions and wrap them up in wax paper and then foil and freeze them so that I, I budget how much I eat because I'll eat the whole freaking loaf, man. It's yep. disgusting. But yeah, I did this. I made some sourdough in my career and then um, had a starter for quite a while then lost it at some point, maybe around 2014 or 15. But I started a new one for for COVID. The COVID sourdough is fun. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, actually watched the videos and learned how to do the the fold knead, which I never did before. I always did a prop, a classic knead, so it's cool. We made our own bread at uh, New World Home Cooking. Our table bread was focaccia, and we made our own focaccia for like twenty years. So, you know, we making basic Italian style breads was part of my every day. I, I got it to the point where, you know, you didn't really have to be a rocket scientist. I taught my El Salvadorian dishwashers to make the bread in the restaurant. They came in, cleaned out the pot sink, made the dough for the next day, sheeted it up, put it in the wok, and we did a 24-hour cold proof. So I had guys that were, this guy Juan was with me 25 years. He was about 60. He'd come in and say, how many bread you'll need today, chef? I'm like, make seven sheet pans. And he had and, you know, we had the recipe for one sheet pan. We used little uh, metal six pans to, to uh, get the yeast. We started like a, the yeast slurry going. So he had his little puddings of yeast going on the top of the convection oven and got the mixture and made it one batch at a time and then went back and washed dishes every night. So people were saying, wow, it's so high tech. I'm like, no, the bread is really, you know, I'm going to give you a funny quote. I worked with Culinary Institute of America externs. I had over 100 externs over 20 years. And the first thing I would, we would talk about food and I'd say, listen, there's three things you need to know how to make. Rice, bread, and chicken soup. I said, everything else is fun and you're a chef. But if you can't make those three fundamental things, don't go past it until you learn how to make that. And they would say, really? I, I've met chefs that work in fine dining restaurants that can't make a pot of, they can't make a pot of rice. Or you try to tell them to make chicken soup, and the chicken soup has lavender and crayfish in it. I'm like, can you just make chicken soup? Learn how to make broth and soup. I travel a lot now, and that's what I find what the world eats is, right? Bread, rice, and soup. I mean, so you learn how to make those things. Learn the fundamentals. It's really important. I think it makes you a happier cook in the long run, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm gonna start wrapping it up here. Is there... Let, let's give another rundown of every, everything you got going on just because there's so much of it where people can find you. Um, like I said, I left some links in, in the description. After this video, you can click right into that stuff. Follow Rick on YouTube and um, you can go to his Flavor Maker Spices and buy some of that stuff at rickorlando.com. But um, go, go ahead and give us another one more rundown of all the stuff that's going on. .com. I usually update the events page. I'll be doing that tomorrow. Uh You muted. You muted yourself, Rick. Yeah. You lost your mic. Technical difficulties. Here it is. Okay, I'm back. There you go. You're back. I'm flailing, man. I'm flailing. <laughs> um, I'll be at. I'm at the Troy Sunday. Uh, make it a New York market. The uh, Aaron and the gang are just starting to get that rolling. So I'm. I'm testing it out. I'm, I'm, you know, it's kind of mellow, but it's not too mellow. And there's some cool people there. You can get you some rare form beer there, some really good Rama soap and some hot sauce. And there's a bunch of other stuff there. Um, 
I've got my pop-ups at Cafe Capriccio at the lower landing. And uh, you can get, if you're missing some of my food, like my four cheese eggplant balls, which are really, really popular, you can get them delivered to your house from Field Goods right now. I stock them every week with about 60 to 100 orders of uh, eggplant balls. They'll come frozen. You just heat them up and eat them. Heat and eat, as they say. And other than that, I mean, you know, like I said, I'm around. I'm doing fundraisers and videos and hanging out with guys like you. And one of these days, folks, I'm going to get Jerry to help me produce my YouTube channel because he does such a good job. His YouTube channel looks really great. Thanks a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I don't, I haven't been able to invest the time in getting those skills down yet. I just, I'm the content guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you know, there's a, it, it's one of those things when, you, when you're, when you're a chef, you got to know where your strengths are and where they're not. And, yeah. and you know, you, if, if that's not what you do, you, you find people that can help you and you delegate, right? Yeah. Um, I, mean, I, I, I enjoy it a lot. Um, but I just haven't put the time in and technology keeps moving faster and faster. If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll under my music, you can see some of the videos that I produced back in the eighties. They're kind of fun. Uh, there's one for stand up and troubled sleep. I co-produced with this guy, Steve Mahan. We did them all in 16 millimeter and super eight and then transferred them to like big wide videotape and then edited it that way, did digital editing. But you know, I, I, lo I love the art form. I just, I, I just haven't been able to invest the time and, you know, getting all the little, uh, what do you call them? The little little toys that make it cute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you know, as far as raw. You, usually though, like what yeah. I'll say is, I watch some of the junkiest stuff on YouTube, stuff that isn't very well produced, and it's all about um, what value can somebody take out of it. And yeah. you know, your your recipes are always packed with you know tips. You always have that kind of character that comes through in those things. So like, even though they might not be the most produced thing in the world. Or, you know, you might think that they're basic. As far as the value they deliver, it's there. So it. I wouldn't I'm worry. Content guy. I give you content. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's exactly. I'm going to reiterate one more time. If, if you haven't tried Purple Haze sauce, you need to get yourself a, a bottle or two or three. Um, this stuff, uh, it's, it's going to be a staple in, in my pantry. Uh, the people on this channel know that I, I have tons of hot sauces. I... Um, it, it's it's really nice to know that this actually is something that's going to be available that you can buy at any time. Which is yeah, cool. I, I don't have to make it. <laughs> well, Primal and Simon's and Plaza just picked up a bunch of it, so if you want to buy some there, that would be helpful. You want to make that's sure actually you... where where I got it. Oh, you did? Oh, good, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Those guys are cool anyway. So yeah, uh, but it's around, and uh, like I said, Dirty Blonde. We should be going into production. Uh, we're waiting for the. Uh, scheduling process to come back so that should be available by mid well it's already almost mid-march probably by the third fourth week of march that that'll be out and then uh we're working on a couple of other things but one of the things i'm working on for summer is i make purple haze sauerkraut <laughs> so we're hoping to have some purple some purple sauerkraut ready uh for hot dog on the on the grill season and that's, I gotta that's actually that's diabolical because you could actually you could do you could play a trick on somebody and actually do it with the purple haze and without the sauerkraut. Yeah, because you could just use purple cabbage. Yeah, you can have them look identical, but not know what you could. That could be a good prank video. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have there's one I have somewhere in my YouTube. I should send it to you. I have a good prank video called How Habanero Rim Job. I had this really pretentious bartender working for me really pretentious who talked like he knew everything about wine and didn't really know that much about wine. So we were sitting out under the gazebo in the garden and uh, the old restaurant, we had a garden in Saugerties and I picked a habanero and he said, I'm going to open some really great wine. And when he wasn't looking, I just cracked the habanero and rubbed it around the rim of his glass. And then he poured the wine for all of us and we're tasting. And I'm like, Hmm, what do you taste? He goes, wow, it's kind of peppery. Wow. It's got a lot of, uh, got a, wow. It's got a lot of high alcohol. It's got a little bit of burn to it. I was like, dude, you just like licked habanero oil. <laughs> you got him. <laughs> awesome. That was good. Well, Rick, I got to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. I think um, I had a lot of fun talking to you and uh, getting sauced a little bit here, yeah. both with the beverage and with the, the saucy sauce. We talked, we talked a little bit about how we just snuck some pineapple onto a pizza, which was awesome. Um, Rick, thanks so much for joining us. And, thanks, uh, Rick. I'll touch base with you sometime this weekend. Okay, great. All right. Take care. Take care. Everybody, thank you so much for joining tonight. I um, 
I really appreciate the, your time and attention to the stream here. Uh, I have links in the bio, not only for Rick Orlando stuff, I have links to my Teespring where you could buy some of my merch. I have shirts that I've been designing up on there. And at Buy Me a Coffee, you could basically tip me or I could, in exchange for, I have a couple ebooks there that are actually very good. Um, both are $5. You can pick those up um, and get that as well. Um, and all that goes towards supporting the channel here. Likes on the video are awesome. Uh, subscribing to the channel, another awesome thing that you could do to help us out here. Um, as far as co content coming up, I have so much I'm excited to tell you about. As far as this weekend, I have a new dining review. It is a, a food truck in Schenectady. I talked about it last week, but that is dropping Saturday morning, just like every every other Saturday morning we do a dining review. I got a recipe video coming next week. We got some more copycat Starbucks recipes. I, uh, I'm excited about that one as well. The last one we did performed pretty well here on the channel, and this one I think is gonna is gonna be another good one. I um I found out last night that one of my videos is getting traffic directly from Starbucks. It's a video they put out about the double shot on ice where it's a two minute video where they basically don't even make the double shot on ice. They pop a can and pour it into a glass and people are clicking from that video into my video through suggested because my recipe is actually what they're looking for. So I think this, vi this video next week that I'm posting is going to be just good for that. Next Thursday, live, we talked a little bit about the pineapple on the pizza tonight. I, uh, I had to, when, when Rick Orlando told me about the pineapple juice, well, when he told me this was good on pizza, I said, wait a minute, there's pineapple in it. And I knew we were going to hit into a little bit of controversy on that. So next week, we're going to talk about pizza toppings. And for that, I'm actually, I have, I have a really special guest, you know, just as special as every other guest that comes on the show here. Um, my cousin, Bobby A., who... His family owned a pizzeria. Um, they still do. It's in Oneana. And uh, he he makes, he and I made pizza and cooking classes in the area. We have some pizza content in the works as well. But um, we're going to talk a little bit about toppings on a pizza, including pineapple. I think he'll have some, some things to say about that. And then after that, it's kind of, I don't know what the next dining post is going to be. I think the next next dining post after that might be the finale for the season, believe it or not. I'm thinking about it because we're going to this place, Arthur's 1795, and I think that might make finale, make a good finale. And then we'll be into season three. It's kind of funny. I've, I've already done over 60 restaurant reviews which is crazy. Think about the money I've spent eating stuff. What else did I want to tell you guys about tonight? Told you about that stuff. Told you about the Teespring. Always do that. Trying to look for... I want to, but I won't. You talking about me, you, or somebody else, you? Let me catch up on some stuff in the chat here. Somebody saying they can't wait. This must have been before the stream. Swamp Fox Cooks. This is somebody who has um, been supporting us really well here. Dom with the grab and go regatta. It's a lot better to do this in real time. I think I, I, uh, I might just can it on the on the comments right now. But anyway, thank you so much for joining. I'm going to cut it off right around an hour here. I, I appreciate all your time. Like I said, like, subscribe, do all that stuff. Uh, leave a comment in the chat, and I'll see it on the way out here. 820 comment. Rory, there actually is no 820 comment. I bet you what happened is there was something offensive in there. And YouTube actually held it back. So I, I can't see it. Sawi, don't be so damn offensive. Um, thank you so much for joining. I will see you next week. We got Bobby A on.